warm welcome from the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. Thank you for joining our panel. I'm Dimitri Lulikov, Research Officer at the Martin Center, and I'll be moderating our today's debate on artificial intelligence and governance. For, for quite a long time, the overall debate and discussion globally on AI was specifically focused on ethics and ethical principles. But in our today's discussion, we are specifically framing our event as moving beyond ethics. We will explore today how Europe can provide a governance framework for our continent, which would hopefully be considered as the global example. Also last week, the European Commission unveiled its proposal for a specific regulation on AI, so we have a lot of important angles to cover today. This afternoon, we're joined by a fantastic set of speakers to walk us through the complexities of AI governance. First, Michal Boni, who is a senior research associate at the Wilfred Martin Center and author of our recent report on AI. Dr. Boni has served as a national minister for administration and digitization in Poland and also a former member of the European Parliament. We are also joined by Eva Maido, member of the European Parliament from the EP Group and president of the European Movement International. Ms. Maido is also the EP coordinator in the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the European Parliament. Last but not least, Kilian Gross, who is Head of Unit, Artificial Intelligence Policy Development and Coordination in DG Connect of the European Commission. Mr. Gross was previously a member of the Cabinet of Commissioner Jottingen, and he has an extensive track, track record in the field of European law and international law. We will proceed as follows. We will have a short kickoff presentation by Dr. Boni, who will present the main findings of his recent report, uh, which was written on behalf of Martin Center. Afterwards, we will continue with the discussion together with Eva and Kilian. This is a live event, so you are encouraged to use Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, send us your questions, send us your comments, and in the last 10 minutes of the event, we'll have a dedicated Q&A with the viewers. So, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Michal Boni and his presentation. Uh, good. like this let's see if, if this is okay because our facebook viewers say that there's a problem with the sound let's try like this but, but, but. 
but now you are you are you you, you, you hear me yes okay so we are going forward without presentation yes if let's try like this okay good so uh, uh, as i have uh, as i have mentioned at the beginning uh, this report was established due to the martin center and uh, my work with my colleagues and partners from business side scientists uh, representatives of consumers and uh, civic organizations what is important to create the artificial intelligence ecosystem uh, and understand how important it is to interconnect uh, some uh, uh, important uh, uh, dimensions as uh, uh, principle-based approach, future-proof approach, data control-based approach, risk-based approach, security-based approach, uh, with focus on human-centric approach, and of course, to find the translation between those kind of dimensions which are important for the uh, artificial intelligence ecosystem, uh, translate, translation to the regulations and uh, the ways of management. When we are talking about management, I think that it is important to find the solution how to manage, how to govern artificial intelligence development by law and by oversight. On the law side, I have uh, stressed the uh, importance of uh, uh, basing uh, uh, solutions on existing regulations. And there were many references in my report and also in the European Commission proposal to GDPR, uh, to machinery directive, to product liability, because all of those are very important. Also, what, what is uh, crucial uh, to ensure that uh, the solutions will be future proof, uh, because it's important for the future innovation. And also, this is a part uh, when we uh, need to use uh, various types of uh, uh, soft law, for example, code of conduct, it was uh, mentioned in the proposal done by European Commission uh, for voluntary uh, using uh, in uh, the special level of risks. When we are discussing about the uh, oversight, it is important to create the network uh, of various partners, uh, European personal data uh, board, uh, high level expert group, uh, fundamental rights agency and so on, but also uh, uh, to uh, find the connections between all auditors and assessment authorities, uh, assessment authorities uh, from uh, national level and uh, from the European level. Uh, what is also important to uh, establish a proper mechanisms for uh, EU and member states institutional cooperation in the uh, EU, uh, European Commission proposal, uh, it is uh, national uh, market surveillance uh, 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 authorities. Uh, I welcome very warmly this concept of uh, EU database uh, of high risk systems, and we need to consider how the European Artificial Intelligence Board should work. In my view, it should be important to add to this board representatives of business. Key uh, is uh, uh, find conditions for making solutions fully implementable and it is, of course, coordination plan, and uh, uh, find conditions for a proper and growing capacity of all partners and uh, institutions. Uh, it is uh, very uh, important uh, uh, to discuss about risk-based approach. Uh, in my report, I have expressed it and presented uh, the view uh, done by German Ethics uh, Commission uh, now we are we are in, in the time in which we are discussing the pyramid of risks, which is important, and I fully agree that we need to indicate this extreme high level of risk uh, with uh, unacceptable risk and danger. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, now we have the high risk, and it is related to uh, all critical sectors. Uh, uh, it should be updated and monitored and uh, updated due the time and also we need to discuss about requirements addressed to applications because not only sectors but users are crucial to understand uh, uh, what we can do uh, uh, minimizing risks or avoiding risks uh, uh, so uh, in this pyramid we have uh, extreme high level high uh, uh, risks 
uh, with many descriptions what we need to do, uh, limit uh, uh, level, uh, it is also important, and the lower list uh, uh, when require, requirements should be a little different. This is important to have this pyramid of risk because this is the background for the discussion uh, uh, how we need to go in the direction of the certification scheme, especially for, for high risk and what we can do and what we need to do uh, when we are uh, uh, discussing and, uh, and want to establish uh, the different level of, uh, of risk. What we need, knowledge about premises and mechanisms related to the artificial intelligence functionalities, assessment of quality of data sets is also important, data for training uh, artificial intelligence, and also uh, relation between risks and the liability system. Uh, it should be discussed uh, now, but uh, we know that uh, uh, it will be the additional proposal done by the European Commission. Uh, uh, this risk-based approach should be related to principle-based approach, uh, which is uh, important to, to avoid uh, information asymmetry. It's crucial for us as users in many roles, and uh, it is related to responsibility, transparency, and explainability. In my report, I have uh, emphasized uh, how important it is to have uh, four levels of this explainability. Explainability addressed to uh, users and uh, explainability addressed to certification authorities with uh, full information and detailed uh, 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 description of mechanisms. Uh, also, uh, explainability addressed to insurance certifications and investigators and to scientists. Uh, it is crucial because if we want to have scientists uh, uh, in cooperation, to have it in cooperation with us, so I think they have need to, they need to have access to uh, uh, to all mechanisms which are important for the functioning of AI. Uh, uh, to which principles uh, 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 solu AI solutions should be referred? Fundamental right is clear. Uh, avoidance of various types of biases, especially hidden biases. It's some kind of ethical sensitiveness. And ensuring the data control architecture for users, because we need to to have the possibility uh, to participate in some uh, interactions, avoidance of manipulative tools, behaviors, emotions, and uh, this is not so easy to describe it. And of course, we need to guarantee solutions of consistency. So limited legitimate models of exceptions, for example, uh, um, uh, related to biometrics, especially remote biometric, uh, should be clear described. And I think that we are going in this direction what we have discussed during consultation and my meetings with many partners. Uh, crucial for the development of artificial intelligence is confirmation assessment. It is addressed to the uh, high risk uh, uh, solutions and models. Uh, in my report, I stressed very strongly uh, to introduce ex ante procedures as a dominant model. Uh, it was a discussion on uh, ethical technology assessment in some civic societies uh, uh, about human rights impact assessment. And of course, uh, practically, we should have combination of ex post and ex ante. Uh, uh, this combination will create much more flexible uh, environment for artificial intelligence development. But uh, of course, uh, what is important to uh, indicate who should be responsible for impact assessment. It should be done internally uh, or externally. And I think that in, uh, in the proposal done by the commission, uh, it is clear that uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, providers should uh, make and should uh, fulfill all requirements uh, and present it to, to the public uh, institutions. Uh, I think that uh, during uh, further discussion, we need to uh, make uh, uh, stronger clarification of the uh, functioning of confirmation uh, assessment. And my conclusions. Firstly, it is not the starting point to establish the most adequate EI ecosystem. We are in the middle of discussions and works and collaborative uh, works with all partners is needed. Also during the time in which uh, 
Council, uh, Commission and uh, European Parliament will work. Uh, thirdly, we want to create a tipping point. I think it's crucial uh, for artificial intelligence development and we need consistent solutions. And within solutions, we need to remember about uh, opening uh, 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 the area the space for investment on artificial intelligence and create regulations in this way in which it will be not uh, 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 limiting uh, any investments and uh, new uh, uh, activities. And uh, what is also important uh, uh, to create uh, the global reference point. Uh, when we have discussed about GDPR, uh, after we have implemented the GDPR, it turned out that it is a global reference point. It is not so easy when we are discussing about artificial intelligence because uh, uh, in many countries, in many regions of the uh, world, there are many advanced worlds on artificial intelligence. So I I'll, think- I'll the, just ask you for final sentences. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One important thing is to collaborate transatlantically. And of course, if you want to have trustworthy artificial intelligence as a key driver, uh, uh, so we need to remember about that uh, advantages should be for all and digital literacy and awareness is necessary. And the last point of avoiding the localization of enforcement. I have many concerns addressed to, to, to the level of uh, national uh, to, uh, member states if they will be ready uh, uh, to implement all those issues and uh, not to kill uh, uh, commonly uh, 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 speaking, uh, uh, the future uh, development. We, wa we know what we uh, uh, need to do and to make, but the question is how, and this is a fundamental question for further de debates. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Boni. Um, to our viewers, uh, I apologize on our side. Um, there was no problem with the sound, but it appears on Facebook there was a little glitch when there is a presentation ongoing. So if you're more interested to check further findings from the report, you can find it on our Martin Center website. Eva, um, your thoughts, your kickoff, if you wanna react or, or walk us through uh, what's on your head, what's on your mind. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Demeter, and uh, thank you, Martin Center, for having me uh, with you today. First of all, I have to thank uh, Michal Boni. I uh, think of you as a, as a friend, but also as a mentor and somebody to look uh, up to uh, in the tech uh, sphere and space. We worked uh, so well together in the parliament, and we continued afterwards. Um, and we were also in touch while you were working on your uh, report. So I really uh, admire the dedication you've put on the topic. Um, and I, I often say, and I so to say, uh, want to propel that in Europe we have more digital leaders, people that uh, could, uh, you know, uh, are fit to, 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 so to say, uh, be part of institutions um, and uh, work on legislation that enables technologies to thrive. Uh, and for me, you're one of them also in your previous capacity uh, as minister. Um, and thanks to Martin Center uh, also for having a discussion at, at the right uh, time. I have to say I'm very happy that um, we can now see a proposal uh, by the Commission on Trustworthy uh, AI. I think it's the right time. It's not necessarily rushed. Um, we've heard calls uh, some months and years ago that it had to come faster and, and so on, but perhaps the timing is right. Um, because now it's really important that we have a concrete legislation to work on. Um, and I really think that this will uh, pave the right path for the European Parliament uh, to channel its efforts, its thoughts, its energy into this proposal and to create some sort of a space for exploring the impact of AI also in other sectors. And this is why I think today's uh, title uh, of the event is very good because AI is not just ethics. So this event, uh, you know, also leads us uh, to these other sectors and other um, um, 
areas uh, to be uh, explored. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, apart from uh, sitting along Kilian and Michal uh, on this event, was also the title, because uh, it's very well embedded also in my work and what I do as coordinator in the Special Committee on AI uh, in the European Parliament. In the beginning of the activity, um, I, for me, was very important and I was very clear that we need to follow very strictly um, also its mandate. Uh, indeed, for us to explore and particularly the AI impact in industry, in health, in agriculture, in finance or education or transport, um, virtually uh, the entire uh, economy. Um, it was difficult to convince uh, some of the colleagues in the parliament whose uh, main and only priority is AI and ethics. Uh, but I'm happy that the committee uh, so far has explored how AI is helping uh, our society um, in fighting diseases, for example, in tackling challenges around the Green Deal or competitiveness uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is why I hope that this proposal will create now the right horizontal framework for um, the clarity the AI developers uh, need in, in every domain. Um, I will not um, now necessarily address the risk-based approach in biometrics because I think we'll get to that uh, throughout uh, the discussion as um, we need to go into more uh, detail. Uh, but I want to uh, bring the attention to three very important points that I believe uh, that make AI made in Europe successful. And some of them were already briefly uh, touched upon uh, by, by Michal. Um, so the first one, and what I think is important uh, to see in, in the proposal is we see provisions on data governments and cybersecurity. AI systems can really only be strong if the data is of quality and if the systems are safe and well protected. Our goal has to be to govern how data is shared um, and only then uh, be able to have it you know, nurture its full potential. Um, it has to be usable, the data. It has to be flowing. Uh, otherwise, we are really wasting uh, those uh, resources. Um, and recently, um, uh, there, there's a report by the uh, Oxford uh, Institute of In Internet Institute uh, that uh, says that 95% of the data collected in Europe isn't even used once. Um, so I always tend to say, just imagine about the B2B collaborations we could have um, and the breakthrough innovation uh, we could achieve um, if more of these data is uh, used, but not even once, but reused. Um, my second point is, um, I think it's very good that we are calling on uh, national regulators uh, to create sandboxes to help the AI development. Uh, this is a step, uh, a very good and bold step in the right direction to help and enable innovation. Um, of course, a regulation will only work if they can be implemented. Uh, and this is why I stand, uh, so to say, by my mantra when I work and when I work on a amendments or reports uh, that we need to make sure that we create this regulation for innovation. And thirdly, it was also one of the last points of, of Michal, um, we need to have this global uh, view. Uh, we should smart enough uh, to be able to talk to the US at the same level. Uh, but we also have to know that we have a lot of European companies that are also global. Um, so when we speak about AI or data flows, uh, nothing will happen in a vague vacuum, um, nor this means that Europe does not win from um, the international AI framework. Um, so I very much like that the AI uh, package looks into uh, exploring uh, this uh, sort of partnerships. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And now I'm happy to pass the floor to Mr. Kilian Gross from the European Commission, who has the, the formidable task of, of giving his highlights from a a, re a regulation which is more than 100 pages. Kilian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dimita, for the uh, nice words and for the challenge to summarize uh, um, a regulation of more, roughly 100 uh, pages in five minutes. But, but I will do my very best. And I had already two excellent speakers 
before me who have put the bar very high. So thanks for inviting me and thanks for having the opportunity to discuss this two outstanding um, uh, knowledgeable colleagues about AI here with, with Eva and with Michael and with you in the Martin Center. I think it's a very good occasion to exchange and to, um, to open the debate because that's really what we want to do. We came up with this proposal and now I think the time is to open up the debate and to bring it to society because there is a lot of interest. Um, I agree to lots of things which Michel and uh, uh, Eva have said, but perhaps let me summarize some key thoughts about our regulation before we enter a bit more in detail later on in, in the discussion. When they came out last week um, on Wednesday, we had two deliverables, and this was important for me because we had a coordinated plan on the support of AI and the regulation. Because we have, since the beginning, we have based our strategy on two pillars. We want to support AI. We have an ambitious target of having 20 billion private and public investments in AI per year during this decade. We've suggested 40 actions how we could reach this target. And we want to make this AI trustworthy. And for us, this goes together because this is not something we don't want to give the impression AI is a dangerous technology and we should try to, to, to avoid it or to restrict it. We think it's a great opportunity for our societies and for our economy. But there are certain risks, and we want to take these certain risks seriously in order that everybody can trust AI and can use it. Because in the end, the purpose of the exercise should be more AI, but trustworthy AI and an easy use and uptake of AI. That's why this regulation is as well an internal market regulation. It should create, that's the first idea, it should create a common market for trustworthy AI. Not 27 different rules, no differentiations, one market, one level playing field, where the consumer can trust or the user that if an AI system bears a CE label, it is safe and trustworthy. And that I think is very important as a start. We uh, just have some ideas we have when we started the long discussion, do we really need such a, a big approach, a horizontal approach, because there are so many different applications and we could, uh, if you look at the US, there's more sectorial approaches on certain items. We think that AI has certain common features and it makes sense to address them together because wherever you use AI, you have these kind of features. And therefore we have gone for this comprehensive approach, which I think makes a lot of sense. It's not very usual for us that we regulate on a certain uses of one technology or one group of technologies, but we think in this case, it makes sense because there are certain risk features which are inherent and we should address in one, in one act and then adapt to the different use cases. We wanted to have a future proof legislation. That's another thing which was very important for us and at the same time a clear legislation because what we learned in the stakeholder consultation is that most stakeholders told us regulation is okay, we understand the need, but we don't want legal uncertainty. We don't want a situation where we always fear uh, we may do something wrong and it's better not to do it or at first to seek legal advice in order to avoid doing something wrong. So this was really a concern for us to make this text clear to make it easy, but to make it future proof at the same time. And we try to square this circle by uh, having dynamic concepts and filling them up with, uh, with lists, like for instance, for the high risk use cases or for the techniques mm -hmm. we consider as AI and allowing for delega delegations in order to update these lists in the future. So to be as concrete as possible so that the user can look, okay, is my technology AI? I look in Annex 1. Am I high risk? I look in Annex 2 and Annex 3. There are the use cases described. I don't have to undergo a complex assessment. I can find out what I have to do. The third key thought is, I think, fully in line with what Michelle has said, we need a risk-based approach. And the first message is a lot of AI is not risky. Um, and therefore, it can be dealt with and traded in Europe without any restrictions. But there are risks, and that's why we created this risk pyramid. And we need proportionate measures to address the different levels of risk. It may be some transparency requirements, it may be an ex ante conformity assessment for high risk, and it may in extreme cases be even a prohibition because we don't want to see certain uses coming up. If we get this right, this package, then we think we can combine both targets to support AI and uh, at the same time to, to make AI trustworthy. Because we think that, of course, in particular for the high risk cases, there are certain additional costs. We have tried to get them as small, as limited as possible, but we cannot deny that operators who have to undergo this under conformity assessment will have certain, certain costs. We built up here the sandboxes, we built a support scheme, we want to have a reduction of fees for startups and innovative small companies, uh, and they can have some leniency in this quality management schemes. 
But the key thing is that we believe for high risk systems in reality, every reasonable company would in any case do a quality management. You will not start a system where you do something sensitive like assisting a judge without a quality management. And that's really what we do, what we uniform here and harmonize here. So we basically set standards where every reasonable operator would by himself uh, already go for certain quality standards. So we think it's not a lot of additional things would be imposed. We clarify mainly, and we, we can, perhaps these are additional things for the so for some operators which may be a bit the uh, the runaways which do not really ensure the quality in these sensitive areas. But for the bulk of the operators, we don't really think there's a lot of additional cost because this will be things that would look in one way or another anyway. And we want to work with industry standards a lot so to facilitate the task as much as we can so that operators know very clearly how to fulfill the requirements. And then it all goes fine. And of course, now the, uh, we are in the hand of the co-legislators and we are looking forward to the discussion. Then I think we can have a regulatory framework which sets the standard for trustworthy AI but which allows as well this technology to take up and to be widely used. That is, after all, our purpose. Thanks. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the concise presentation. I, I'm quickly picking up on, on a couple of the points which were already raised. Let's let's focus on risk. And maybe I want to pose this question to Michal and to, to Eva uh, for their response. The regulation creates this separation between unacceptable risk, high risk, and limited risk. Do you think these divisions are clear cut? Would there be any problem potentially when it comes to implementation in the future? Michal, maybe your thoughts on this? Oh, uh, uh, openly speaking, I think that there will be many problems because it is not so easy. There is a description, and uh, uh, I, I think that now it's clear uh, uh, what shouldn't be and what uh, shouldn't be. Uh, uh, accepted uh, uh, when we are discussing about this extreme level of risk. But I think that uh, there are many uh, uh, ways to assess the risk. We need to combine the psychological assessment of risk and uh, physical assessment, yes. And uh, this is a real problem in some types of risks, uh, especially when we are talking about mental risk or psychological risk, how to how to uh, how it should how we can describe those risks, but I think that this pyramid now, uh, uh, with non-acceptable risks, uh, high risk, limited risk, and the low risk, uh, uh, it's okay, and uh, this is a very good starting point for further discussion, uh, 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 and I fully agree with uh, uh, with uh, the uh, what Killian uh, have said. Uh, that there are many applications, there are many users without any risk. So I think that what is important, not only to create the regulation, but also to have, and I hope that uh, uh, this, uh, this European Artificial Intelligence Board could make this in the future, to monitor, because the situation is vivid, yes, there are many new applications, new solutions, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence is developing very fastly. So I think we have starting point with the pyramid of risks. Uh, uh, we need to monitor the description of those risks and uh, uh, updating uh, those. And uh, on the other hand, we need to make uh, 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 clear some distinctions be between, le between uh, levels of risk. Thank you. Um, Eva, your thoughts? Um, yeah, just uh, briefly, I mean, um, when it comes to the risk-based approach, um, it's been something that um, the parliament, but also stakeholders have been calling for. So in a way, it's not a, a new concept. And even before the commission started drafting, um, there were a number of stakeholders um, and I, announcing that they would in any way abide by the rules which will make uh, AI um, more safe, more ethical, uh, more transparent. And here, picking also on what Michal said, I mean, the high-level expert group um, has piloted some of those ethical principles. Um, and the task um, ahead is to make sure that the AI community in every member state is actually aware of this regulation um, that is indeed clear um, that there is legal certainty. Um, and um, 
when it comes to the deployment um, on an update on a large scale, so to speak, we must have everyone concerned on board uh, to help us improve the regulation and indeed make it implementable, I would say. Kilian, maybe you want to add, jump in on that if you have any thoughts. The microphone, please. It's very interesting what, what you both said, and I, I, I can largely agree. I think what is important for us is um, it is, of course, a complex assessment to identify the risks. And we, we put a lot of thought into that when we, uh, when we did the drafting. Uh, the basic ideas are, may appear simple. It's about how likely it is that a certain damage or harm occurs. And then, of course, the second question is how big or how reversible or how serious would that harm be for the individual? And we tried really to look into the practical side of things, namely, is, is this a hypothetical case or are these cases re real? Have the evidence that these cases occur and that these cases have caused trouble? That's how we identified the, the use cases. What we thought is really important here is that the legislator makes this exercise um, to undergo the assessment and to identify the cases where we have sufficient uh, factual evidence that we can say a certain use is high risk. We did not take the option, which might have sounded nicer, but um, would I think be much more burden for business to just give an abstract risk definition in the regulation and then leave it to business and to operators to find their way through. That may sound very nice and very scientific, and you can uh, I would have an easier stand today in defending it because it's rather abstract and then you can easily agree. But for the individual operator coming to the market, it would have been very, very difficult to identify the risk level and therefore the right legal consequences from this different from this risk level and bearing in mind that we want to have in cases that is high risk a, a regulation which really provides for certainty so there are sanctions there is it should have teeth there is it should have teeth the, the regulation after after all otherwise it makes no sense we didn't want to create that uncertainty therefore we made this effort of being as precise as possible to identify in the regulation what are the criteria which we have used to uh, to find out to identify what we think are high risk use cases to leave room to amend this over time because we don't know the future and this is very fast moving and nobody can really say how and where ai will all be used in three four years down the road from now but i think this is uh, for us an important element in order to have a clear regulation and not to have a regulation where you basically then have always kind of uh, you leap complex self assessments and risk assessment to operators and put this uncertainty on them. This was the key, a guiding principle for us. Thank you. Dimitra, um, if I can add something. Yeah, of course. Uh, Short comment. Just please. on the one, because in the regulation, it is a proposal of sandboxes, Eva mentioned it. I think it's very important because this is the area in my view, in my mind, the area for some experiments, uh, ex uh, experiments, yes, and uh, it's much more safe to, uh, to 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 go this way using sandboxes, and after that to check what is really risky or what is completely not risky, but very useful, of course, for uh, uh, artificial intelligence development. I would like to now to frame the discussion and be a bit more specific because we talk about maybe abstract concepts for viewers, risk, high risk, sandboxes. Let's talk about one of the hottest issues, um, especially picked up by, by media and uh, civil society organizations. And this is biometric mass surveillance. Throughout this debate, it seems that now again, we're trying to find the balance between personal privacy and national security implications. So, um, and my question goes first to, to Eva, um, do you think that uh, biometric surveillance should be outright fully banned as advocated by some civil society groups or national authorities should have some, some, some leeway? What do you think? Yeah, thank you. Um, indeed, um, sometimes, um, you know, if, if you don't go through the whole regulation, you would um, get the, the feeling that that's the only point of, of the regulation if you read uh, certain blog posts or, or, or articles. Well, I think that the state must um, always try to, to seek uh, a balance, a balance between um, freedoms and protection. Um, it's a it's main function of, of the state. Uh, providing freedoms uh, for citizens um, 
uh, to fulfill their potential, their uh, ideas, uh, even their dreams, um, but at the same time uh, providing the safety um, and the security net that is uh, needed. Um, I think we all want to uh, make sure that we avoid the surveillance state and a of Orwell society. Um, and this is why I would say um, that if activists are not entirely happy and if the law enforcement authorities have their reservations as well, um, maybe this means that the proposal is somewhere in the middle um, and it's uh, balanced and, 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 and well enough uh, formulated. Um, I would like to um, move away from the polarizing debate that the state is always the one that's the evil um, and it never means good to its citizens. Um, I think that the state provides many services that could uh, help society uh, and can play really this safety net whenever it's, it's needed. Um, if we ban technology, we might deprive ourselves from some effective ways to fight uh, crime. Um, and I think we need to also keep that thing uh, in mind. Um, as, as every innovation uh, in government, uh, the democratic scrutiny in the same time, and of course the checks and balances are so important for achieving this uh, tech-enabled society, if I may uh, refer to it in this way. So these would be my, my, my thoughts on that. Kilian, thoughts? Oh, we have lots of thoughts about this chapter because we um, this, this did not come unexpected. But I'm very grateful for, uh, for Eva because I think you put it into the right frame. Let me perhaps clarify two or three thoughts because sometimes I think uh, in the public discussion, this is not always completely fully taken up. Um, it, so perhaps it's, it's worth to underline two or three features of what we propose to, to, to give a clearer picture. The first thing I think which cannot be underestimated is that we will make every uh, biometric identification system high risk. This is very, very important. And we even put additional obligations like for ICE principle and the increased logging obligations. Why is this important? Because one of the key problems of this biometric uh, identification systems is the lack of quality and accuracy, because we have a lot of false positive. This leads to false suspicion. If the data are biased, minorities might be discriminated and so on. So the, here is really a, a, a very much the heart of the problem. We will make sure with the requirement that the systems, if at all used in Europe, will be uh, accurate, will be fair, will be transparent, and will uh, follow our requirements. I think this is the first thing that you need always to, to realize. This is a big, a big step because now you can put whatever system up. In the future, the systems will have to undergo a very strict scrutiny. The second element which we need to bear in mind is that we don't start this from scratch because we have already in Europe a strong data protection legislation. We have the, the general data protection regulation which prohibits the processing of biometric data in Article 9 with certain exceptions. We have the law enforcement directive prohibiting the processing of biometric data in Article 10. And we have for the EU institutions as well a data protection uh, directive. So we have basically already a system where this is in principle prohibited with exceptions. Mm -hmm. So we need to bear in mind that if now we say everything is allowed, this is not true. This was never allowed in Europe because we have a different situation than in the States. We have these rules in Europe in place. What we did now, we think that the GDPR is, is sufficient because it provides for a prohibition with very narrow exceptions and these exceptions that will continue to apply. So we, we didn't allow it completely. This is not true. We just we think we don't need to add something to this prohibition, which is already in GDPR. For the law enforcement directive, we go a bit further. We say there the discretion is rather wide for the member states because it's law enforcement and police work is largely uh, uh, in the competence of the member states. Here we narrow the space, the amount of maneuver of the member states significantly because we say you can only look for three. This is in principle banned and you can only look for it under very narrowly defined circumstances for a missing person in the case of a terroristic threat and in case you have a crime under the European arrest warrant and the minimum uh, penalty for this. And it must be all uh, basically justified and checked by a judge and it must be proportionate. This is as well, I think, very important because this means you cannot have a 24 hour seven mass surveillance. It means you can only have a targeted use of this technology in case which is justified. We try to find very clear justifications and which has been checked by a judge. You cannot just run the systems all the time. This, I think, is 
a band for a surveying state if this is the because this is clearly the underlying risk so i think that should not be should not be overlooked in in that debate i think that is um uh, this is very important and will leave, uh, lead to a significant restriction and last but not least we do not provide here in this legislation um, an authorization for the use of biometric. We allow member states to introduce this. I think that is well an important point to, to take into account. What we say is we provide a uniform frame at the EU level in which member states can work. Uh, we narrow this because we think we have a common, we have these current values and we have a common understanding. We don't want to have a surveillance state. We don't want to have an unlimited use of this technology in the public space in real time. So we narrow the space for member states, but member states stay free to make use of this option in the, within the boundaries which this proposal fixes, but they don't need to do it. If a member state feels I do not want to have this on my territory, there is nothing in this regulation obliging anybody to do this. So this is basically, I think, our approach, which takes, as, as Eva pointed out, should strike the balance and allow in this limited way uh, as well the discretion for the member states who to find for them the right balance, but within the boundaries, which I think are compatible with uh, what we consider the European values. Thanks. That was an extremely important uh, clarification about biometric surveillance. It should not be 24 seven, it should be justified and also sanctioned by a judge. So thanks so much for this, uh, for this clarification. Um, we have lots of questions coming from the audience. So I'd like to open up the debate and include a couple of points um, online. Uh, we have a question from um, Susanna Maria. Our research and development uh, with artificial intelligence and the role of research institutes incorporated in the regulation. So is R&D and un universities incorporated in the regulation? This is one question. And the other one, I think most of them are um, connected, uh, related to Killian, to be honest. And the second one is, could you clarify concrete examples of how do you provide assistance to European companies in order to move forward with cyber secure I solutions. So universities in R&D, number one, and secondly, how uh, is, is the commission or the regulation envisaging to provide support for European companies? Um, I'll give the floor to Kilian, and then maybe I'll open up the debate about business in general. No, thanks a lot. And I don't want to dominate this too much because I, li I like too much to listen as well to my co-speakers who have so many insights. Uh, on R&D, um, I think the regulation is very clear. We kick in when, oh, the regulation, but we, I, I work too much on it, so I personalize it already. Uh, no, the regulation will kick in once an AI system enters the market or is put into use. So everything which happens before is not covered by this regulation. So if you do research, if you test, if you try, this is outside. What interests us is if you start to go into the deployment phase and you start to enter the market. And this is important for us. We don't want to prevent research. And then we have, of course, as we mentioned already, and I think it's very important, we have the sandboxes. They should help you to gap, fill the gap between this uh, research and then the, the entry on the market, because they're in this final deployment phase where you have to, um, to do the ex ante conformity assessment to get your certificate there. You have a sandbox helping you and to provide you a protected environment, and even it may help you to repurpose certain data with, um, with these safeguards, which I mentioned in the, in the regulation. What do we do to help? Um, I think I mentioned already we have an, a whole article for the support for SMEs and startups. They will get priority access to the um, to the sandboxes. They will get reduced fees for the ex ante conformity assessment, and they will get advice. Um, so we what we plan is we have that is part of our coordinated plan as well. Um, I will mention there we will have a, a network of 200 more than 200 digital innovation hubs in the EU, which should now be rolled out. Um, based on the Digital Europe program. There should be one hub at least in every member state specialized on artificial intelligence. And that would be, for instance, a contact point in particular for our small and medium sized companies to get the knowledge, to get to understand where to turn to, how to, uh, to prepare themselves and to really get practical advice. I think this decentralized uh, network approach is best so that everybody finds in their region a counterpart, a competent counterpart who should help them in particular in early phase to get uh, his development on the right track. That's a bit our, in a nutshell, our vision. Fantastic, thank you very much. I wanna move to um, to Eva. We, I also received a notification that she might uh, need to leave us in a couple of minutes. 
So, um, MEP Maidel, what are your thoughts about the impact on businesses? Do you think this would be a burdensome regulation or actually private companies need some guidance and standards? Um, well, you know, um, sometimes uh, there's the businesses who actually are proponents of we prefer to have a regulation so we know also as Kilian mentioned uh, so it's all clear so there's legal certainty and we prefer to go in 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 that way uh, but even if it's burdensome or whatever it might create extra costs and so on and so forth but at least we know what the regulation and there's always the one that would prefer to have less regulation. So um, I think um, there is a mixed, uh, so to say, um, uh, mixed, um, you, you know, mixed feelings. Um, I have to say that um, we have been reached out by by many stakeholders. Um, some of them um, believe that regulation and this type of regulation could increase uh, bureaucracy, bureaucracy um, and the self-assessment uh, may have a basically a deterring effect or may make it more costly. Um, on the other hand, um, other uh, European developments uh, say uh, we need to pave the way for the world um, and have Europe at the forefront. Um, so if we uh, open and look at this question towards the outside, right? Um, a bit like the way we did it with GDPR, um, you know, we are going to set a standard um, and our standards have been beneficial in the end um, in many other areas. And I um, think um, that, you know, it could be a good way uh, for us to rally behind global actors, whether that's uh, some of the countries in the Asia Pacific or the US or the countries uh, part of the OECD. Um, it, it, mm. it, it puts us, uh, you know, at, at, at a different standing vis-a-vis -vis the businesses, uh, whether they're originating from Europe or they operate in Europe. Um, and, and so I think I, I think it's, you know, that's why I said I think it, we needed a time to think about for this regulation to come um, and, and to be presented. And I think it, it's, a, it's a good momentum now. Michal, your thoughts on business innovation? You know, I think that it is very important to, to open the, the space for business innovation. My view uh, when we are discussing about technology regulation and innovation is that uh, very often we need much more soft law, which means code of conduct, self-regulation, co-regulation, and it is done in this regulation, uh, but uh, at, at this level, which is, uh, which is rather, rather related to, to this uh, minimal or uh, low level of risk. But on the other hand, uh, I agree that we need to have uh, uh, some tools for self-assessment, and it's better to have it. But what is crucial to have the framework, uh, the regulatory framework, uh, identical in all European countries. Uh, it was a part of our discussion on biometrics. Uh, I'm full of concerns that it will then, if it will go to the member states, uh, looking at my government now, uh, it will be very dangerous, yes, because they will be ready to use biometric tools uh, in their special own way. So I think it is crucial for democracy and it is crucial for uh, technological development and business and economic development to have the common rules all over the Europe. So this is uh, uh, one of the important issues. And on the other hand, we need to create, this is a question of implementation of, of, of those solutions, uh, as Eva expressed and, uh, and Kilian earlier. Uh, we need to have uh, more guidances for uh, small medium enterprises, yes, because uh, they, they need to support, they need to help. So I think that we need to translate some rules which are in the proposal uh, uh, into SMEs, uh, uh, possibilities, uh, opportunities and barriers and after they discuss there is in, the, in a very special way with them uh, what is needed for them and uh, how to finally uh, establish uh, uh, the legal rules. The, the point on SMEs was, was really good and this reminds me of the debate after GDPR when smaller companies had some difficulties in implementing the regulation, for example. 
We have only a couple of minutes left, and we just received a really good question on Twitter from uh, Mikhail Benyamou, short and, and sweet. The U.S. intends to spend $8 billion on artificial intelligence, um, while uh, the EU plans for 1 billion euros, according to the European Commission's plan. How can Europe fill the gap? Will we use the recovery plan to support artificial intelligence? So money, the gap, and maybe transatlantic cooperation. Um, let me give the floor to, to, to Eva. How can we fill in the gap and your thoughts on transatlantic uh, angle? Um, thank you. Um, one would say uh, use the resources you have in a smarter way, all right? Um, we could also say uh, put the money where our mouth is. Uh, we've been discussing about uh, the digital agenda, the digital single market, however you want to phrase it, however people address the technological advancement in Europe uh, through regulations or initiatives or projects um, for quite some time now. Um, and I would end up and wrap up um, on this question with something that I started. I, I said uh, and I spoke about digital leaders and is, is a call that I make very often in various discussions and debates that I speak. So this does not have to be people that code or software engineers that are in elected positions or in government positions. These have to be people to understand the realities of the time we're living today. Um, we cannot not just be competitive. We would not be able to close the gap, but we are also not going to be resilient enough if we do not heavily and very strategically and very organized invest in key infrastructure, invest in basically making sure that, you know, we make the best use of these regulations that we put in place or the huge resources we have in the recovery fund um, and in the budget overall each year. So um, I often say that I think with the previous crisis, um, we kind of lost the momentum to advance into forward-looking uh, projects and initiatives. We kind of did the projects of yesterday. So today, it will be important not to do the projects of today or of tomorrow. It would really be important to do these projects that will make us more prepared for 2030, 2040, 2050. And that is investing in innovative technologies that could bridge uh, the gaps, not just with the US, but it could also make us bridge the ambitious gaps we have to fulfill in vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the Green Deal, for example. Um, and so it, it, it would require both leadership and being a digital leader means that you could be preparing your country or um, your continent uh, to, to face the future in a more confident way and in a better prepared way. So um, even with less resources, if you put them in the right and invest them in the right um, endeavors, uh, you could probably be very well prepared. Um, it would be important to collaborate with the like-minded, uh, uh, so to say, partners, with the ones that share our values. The U.S. is definitely one of these. I mean, you could think eight plus one is nine. So what could we together do with nine billion, right? It all depends how you see it and what opportunities uh, you would see in um, in 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 the in in the in numbers. Uh, once we talk about the numbers, now it's time to talk about the projects. It's time to talk about the European players or the global players that could all help us be more competitive. Um, so next time, let's put the numbers into projects and ideas. Thank you. I, I just hope, Eva, thank you. I just hope that the American establishment shares your optimism. Um, Killian, maybe under a minute, if you can, closing thoughts. And are we are we chasing up after the US? Well, um, I think. We should not only see this just purely from a, uh, from chasing up with first and with second is not like a like a sports game, but of course we need to in, uh, reinforce our efforts, and I think we have. I think what we what we need is a, a balanced um, view. We have a lot of strengths in Europe. We have industrial data. We have robotics. We have areas that are really strong. So we don't need to to shy away and feel that we are completely behind. I think that would be wrong. But on the other side, I think we need as well to realize that we have to make now a serious effort and we cannot um, 
continue in this space in, in digitizing our economy and society. So we need to step up up a gear. So this, I think we need to, we have a reason to be self-confident, but we need as well to make an additional effort. And I think now we have this one building here for, uh, for artificial intelligence, which of course with members, member states money should be accumulated to this. So if you look at the US, it should not be the 1 billion, but the 1 billion from the EU and what the 27 offer. And then it should be private investment on top of this. So that's how we want to achieve the 20 billion, which I think could make a difference. The recovery and resilience facility, I think is very important. 20% should be for a digital and artificial intelligence should certainly be a good part of this. But I think we have now with the RRF and with the Digital Euro program, we have the means at, at our hands. So we, we now need to make, as Eva put it, we need to find good projects and really make a serious effort. So we don't need to be uh, timid. Uh, we can be self-confident because we have certain strengths, but we cannot um, allow ourselves to wait longer. I think that's a bit the message I would like to give. Thanks. That, that's a great that's a great punchline. Thank you. Um, Michal, closing thoughts and how can we close the gap maybe on AI and I when we talk about EU and the US? Uh, but firstly, I think that uh, we need to uh, establish and create the better uh, awareness of the problem, especially among political elites. When I'm looking uh, at some countries, uh, there is a big problem if uh, politicians understand what is going on and how important artificial intelligence is for the, for the holistic development in all areas from health via uh, climate challenges, management and so on and so on. So this is crucial. This is uh, first. The second, uh, uh, I think that we need to cooperate with United States. And uh, of course, this is a uh, competition uh, uh, how much uh, financial sources we can uh, we can use, but on the other hand, it it would be great if we will have if we will start the discussion about common standards, and I think it will be easier to have those common standards because after that we can discuss about investments uh, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence in Europe done by uh, European Union done by uh, national governments, public money, but also done by European companies and also done by global companies, uh, not Chinese, because it will be dangerous, but uh, some kind of common efforts. Yeah? So I think uh, this is the way to, to work together, to find common solutions, to discuss about common standards and also uh, to convince our political leaders that artificial intelligence development is crucial for our future. This is a, a fantastic way to end our debate. Um, we just ran out of time. I would really want to thank our, our viewers uh, for being part of, of our today's discussion. A uh, warm thanks to our panelists, for, uh, for Eva, uh, Kilian and, and Michal, for walking us through the complexities of AI governance in Europe and helping us uh, in, in the quest of, of, of um, the, the road towards trustworthy AI in Europe. Thank you very much. Stay tuned with the Martin Center and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.